Hello, everyone. I'm Jessica Cachalo, and I'm the executive director. Uh, we are the philanthropic uh, part, official philanthropic partner of the Shenandoah National Park, and I've been at the helm of the trust for a little over a year now. I think most of you are familiar with the trust's mission and work, but for those of you who are not, our mission is to fund programs and initiatives that help protect, enhance, and preserve the resources of Shenandoah National Park for all to, all to enjoy for this and future generations. Um, we donate over $500,000 annually through the generosity of many of our supporters to the park. One of the initiatives the trust supports is the fight against invasive um, species and pests in Shenandoah. And we are proud to have been, have been supporting this endeavor for the past seven years. Uh, tonight, we're gonna learn more about the fight to save the hemlocks. Um, the hemlock woolly adelgia has long ravaged Shenandoah's hemlock trees, and uh, we look forward to hearing more from Rolf and um, uh, Scott, who have been working to help save those trees with some cool biocontrols. We'd like to thank our individual donors and um, two private foundations for their support of this work. It couldn't happen without our supporters. Um, I hope you all enjoy tonight's presentation, and without further ado, I would like to turn the program over to Pat Kinney, Superintendent of the Shenandoah National Park. Thanks, Jessica. Good evening, everybody. It's a real pleasure to see uh, many names in the in the list of participants that I recognize. Uh, I know many of you are supporters of the Shenandoah National Park, which in turn is a supporter of Shenandoah National Park. Uh, we really appreciate all the support we get. I have to uh, echo a lot of the thoughts that Jessica shared. Uh, the Shenandoah National Park Trust is our philanthropic partner. They allow us to take on many conservation and educational efforts that wouldn't be happening uh, with the federal dollars that we receive as part of the appropriations. So again, uh, over a half million dollars is donated by the trust to the park and allows us to do great work. And so, and I know many of you are supporters of that. So thank you for your support. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce you to a program that is trying very diligently to uh, combat uh, an invasive, uh, the hemlock woolly adulgent. Uh, we have uh, some great presenters from you that are, are uh, very much experts in dealing with this. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce Rolf Gugler, who's a park biologist here at Shenandoah. Rolf has worked in the park since 1988, um, so just a few years. Uh, and he's been in his current role as a park biologist since 1998. Um, since 2003, he's been at the helm of our forest health uh, program here in the park. And to me, one of the critical things about Shenandoah is the forest. If we think of this park, um, you just got to think about it. Yeah, I think people get caught in the mountains part of it, but it's the, the preservation of that forest and all the species that live in it. Um, and that's one of the things we're trying to do very hard here at managing uh, forest health. And uh, so tonight we're going to hear about those efforts uh, that Rolf is the leader for the park on, on fighting uh, hemlock woolly adulgent. And so without further ado, I want to turn it over to Rolf, uh, a great steward, a uh, great biologist, and a great uh, supporter of Shenandoah National Park. Rolf, take it away, please. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate that. Let's go ahead and share my screen here. So thank you, Pat. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about our hemlock woolly adelgid management program and also about the status of the eastern hemlocks in the park. So, so sometimes people will ask me, you know, why do we do so much to protect our hemlocks from the invasive hemlock woolly adelgid? And I think a good example of that is the, the, is the black burning warbler seen here. Uh, it's a hemlock forest dependent species. Um, it's a species that's been declining uh, over the last 25 years in our region, but also in the park. And that's largely due to habitat loss and due to the loss of hemlocks. So, you know, and, and actually after the last, over the last 25 years, I've only seen one black burning and warbler in the park. So uh, that's just one sort of thing to think about as we enter into sort of a more broad overview. So talking about hemlock forest significance, uh, we need to sort of start start with the adelgid, uh, start, with, start with hemlocks rather. Um, the hemlock is uh, an evergreen that supports a unique e ecosystem. 
uh, commonly found along mountain streams, northeast facing slopes. Uh, it provides important shade and cooling to the forest understory and to streams. And this creates a cool, moist microclimate that supports oxygen rich waters and rare plants and animals. Um, not just the Blackburnian warbler, but uh, a series of uh, uh, invertebrates, uh, small mammals, things like southern redback vole, uh, woodland jumping mouse, smoky shrew, red squirrel, things like that, but also the, the iconic brook trout. Uh, but since 2003, the majority of this critical habitat has been severely degraded. And just looking at the hemlock forest from a historical standpoint, a good place to start with that is the Limberlost old growth forest prior to 2003 and the demise of the hemlocks in that area. This was a historically significant area. This was an area where you could, as a visitor, walk among trees that were four foot wide in diameter. These were trees that were 350 years old, give or take. It was just a great place to escape the summer heat. And explore. So talking a little bit about the decline of the hemlock and some of the HWA or hemlock woolly adelgid monitoring that we're doing. Um, the invasive hemlock woolly adelgid was first discovered in, in Shenandoah National Park in 1988. That was about the same year I came. Um, it's a tiny insect. It's similar to an aphid. It feeds on the tree's starch reserves. It's a sap feeder. It causes needle dieback and decline and death within three to five years. At that time in the late 80s, there were no natural enemies present to, present to control HWA. The park began monitoring hemlocks around that same time in the late, in the late 80s, and they wanted to determine HWA, hemlock woolly adelgid distribution, and to assess tree health. And, and from 1994 to 2003, heavy infestations of HWA plus two droughts in the early 2000s led to tree decline and widespread, widespread tree mortality. So by 2003, upwards of 95% of the park's hemlocks had succumbed to the adelgid. And many of the same, many, much of the same thing was happening throughout the central Appalachians. And after 2003, the, hem the uh, hemlock woolly adelgid continued to sort of make its southwestward march down towards places like the Blue Ridge Parkway and also to the Smokies. And those, those agencies or those, those units continue to battle the HWA as well. Hemlock Springs is a location in the park. Uh, it's near milepost 3940. Um, it's a good example of what these sites look like after the hemlock woolly adelgid ravaged, ravaged these areas. So that's what it looked like in 2004 after we saw nearly 95% mortality of hemlocks. But I just want to show you this quick graph to show you how quickly the HWA caused decline and mortality in this site. So in 1999, the crown health rating for this site was 70% live crown. That's pretty good. Um, but by 2001, two years later, it was already down to 15%. At that point, trees are dead and dying. You know, you're not being able to bring those trees back with any kind of pesticide treatments. So nearby, over near milepost 43 and just south of Skyland is Limberlost. We talked a little bit about that earlier. That's the area with the, the uh, old growth hemlocks. That's what this site looked like in 2003. And the HWA was ravaging this site as well. We had done some chemical foliar treatments in this area during the 90s, mid 90s through late 90s. And that may have staved off the HWA a bit, but such we had such heavy infestations of HWA in the Limberlost area, we couldn't stop uh, the advance of the HWA. And eventually we lost those trees at Limberlost. So this is what it looked like in September of 2003 on the left. And you can see these old growth trees, they're just dead snags by then. Um, unfortunately, this, this area also was the site of and is the site of an accessible trail. So because this, this accessible trail existed within this old growth grove, now with mostly dead snags of hemlocks, park management felt it was important and responsible to uh, remove those trees because those were hazard trees now. So that, that happened in September 2003. And four years later, that site looked like the lower right hand image. And you can see, you know, there aren't any large trees left. 
Um, there's a, a sort of a blanket of black birch seedlings and saplings at this point. So we were seeing native regeneration of black birch coming into this site. So it, it had a very uh, ample seed source in the soil of uh, black birch, but that's not the case at all sites. And we'll talk about that in the next slide, what came in after hemlocks essentially. So from our long-term ecological monitoring program, the folks that work in our botany department, um, they provided us with this information and these sites that contained hemlocks and then lost hemlocks. Um, the species that came into those sites uh, are some of the obvious ones you could probably think of. Uh, certainly oak is a very common species in the park, red oak, white oak, etc. Uh, oaks, birch, maple, ash, and tulip trees in that order. Uh, exotics weren't too bad. They were only about 2%. Uh, and our crews would go in there, exotic vegetation crews would go in there and try to remove exotics in those sites. Uh, and they continue to do that to date. Those exotics or things like garlic mustard, uh, some of the exotic smart weeds, a little bit of oriental bittersweet, things like that. So a little bit of an HWA or hemlock bullia delgid overview. Um, some of you may know that the park is mandated by policy to reduce the impacts of invasive species. Jessica mentioned that in the beginning a little bit. Um, and, and SNP's goal, the park's goal, is to preserve the remaining hemlocks as a seed source for future recovery. Um, so that's important to note, both of those. That goes to the why you know, we do some of this work. Um, and since 2005, we've been suppressing HWA in surviving hemlock stands and treating upwards of 2,500 to 3,500 trees per year. And those current treatments involve using imidacloprid, which is a systemic pesticide, and we're injecting that pesticide around the base of the tree, metered doses. Uh, it's sort of uh, specific to the diameter and the size of each tree. It's at the minimum dosage level. And they're much more efficient. That method is much more efficient than past efforts that were foliar treatments of insecticidal soap and, um, and horticultural oils. Uh, since 2005, 29,000 trees have been treated and protected, and tree health has improved at all those sites. And over that time and during that time, um, we've been trying to get the word out about the importance of uh, and managing invasive species in the park, and sp specifically the hemlock bully adelgid, and, um, and teaching people about that, and all our monitoring efforts with the hemlock bully adelgid and the hemlocks. This is a poster that we put together years ago. We use a lot of social media posts. We have a, a pretty good active website for that. And then in 2015, um, we, went, we entered a partnership with Virginia Tech and Dr. Scott Salem, who you'll hear in a little bit, and um, we wanted to become less reliant on chemical controls. And we wanted to look towards biocontrols. Uh, and we were also concerned about trees that we weren't able to treat that were located too close to water for some of our chemical treatments. So we entered into this partnership and we, and we looked at the, uh, the biocontrol Laracobius at the time. And uh, Virginia Tech was doing some great work with Laracobius osakensis at the time. And we were able to, to work it out and get all the uh, environmental compliance cleared by our superintendent at the time. And we began doing releases every other year. So in 2015, 2017, and 2019, we did releases of Laracobius beetles. And those were lab rear beetles. And Dr. Scott Salem can talk about that a little bit if you like. And then more recently in 2021, we partnered with the trust to do sort of an augmented expanded version of that because we wanted to put more predatory beetles out on the landscape and get 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 better coverage essentially and uh, the trust funded those three releases in 2021 so there were three releases in the south district in 2021 so we have some pictures of that in a little bit and our overall goal was to become more self-sufficient and um, and have us more self-sufficient program in 10 to 15 years and essentially we wanted to get off of that chemical treadmill eventually. Here are a couple pictures of the Laracobius releases. And in the left image, you can see how small these beetles actually are. They're only about the size of half a grain of rice. And if you think about it, they're a tiny beetle, predatory beetle, feeding on an even tinier adelgid, which is like an aphid, which is about half the size of a flea. You know, And this tiny little adelgid can take down a 350-year-old hemlock tree. So that's pretty astounding to think about. Here's some of the monitoring 
pictures that uh, I've gathered uh, from Dale Meyerhofer, our lead forest health technician. And um, those folks and his volunteers do great work and they're doing efficacy monitoring in sites where we've released beetles in the past. So we're seeing some really good results of Larry, Laracubius establishment and spread at some of those sites. Uh, Scott may talk about that a little bit and or we may talk about that a bit more in the Q&A at the end. And here's a picture of the Laracobius beetle in the lower right hand corner and that's about a five times blow up and you can see how small that is. So for future management, um, we want to continue to partner with Virginia Tech and the SNPT, SNP Trust and we're going to hope to do two releases of Laracobius beetles at least two at at least two sites per year. We want to gradually scale back insecticide treatments over the next 10 years. We want to continue to look for clusters of healthy hemlocks for future beetle releases. We want to start thinking about how we may want to use our own wild harvested beetles at Shenandoah and put some of those beetles out onto new sites as well. That may be two or three years down the road. Uh, we want to continue to do hemlock crown health monitoring in both of those management zones and try to uh, monitor efficacy. And sort of, I just wanted to make a shout out to the trust and say that much of this work wouldn't be possible without the generous support of the SMP trust. Lastly, I want to do, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Scott Salem. We've been wor working with Dr. Scott Salem uh, for the last uh, seven years or so. Um, he heads up the HWA biocontrol program at Virginia Tech Entomology Lab. Uh, he has a real passion for this work. And he'll tell you a little bit more about the biocontrol efforts there, the lab reared stuff that they do, as well as some of the, possibly the, the, the wild harvesting work. And uh, we really appreciate all his help over the years. Uh, welcome, Dr. Salem. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate that. It was a very good overview. And so I think I'll share my screen now. All right, so uh, let me introduce you to my lab group here. Just briefly, uh, we work on invasive forest pests. Uh, some of them are insect pests. We also work on weed pests. And I have a fantastic crew uh, that helps me uh, do all this important work. And so let me start by showing an image that I took at, a, at your sister park at the, in the Great Smoky Mountains. Uh, just a few years ago, and that's a that's a slope with a uh, large amount of dead hemlock trees. So similar to what Rolf showed you, and this is kind of what we've seen in the Appalachians. So really impactful uh, as a result of the insect. And this is the insect. So I'm going to cover a little bit of what Rolf already had mentioned, but uh, you know, just cover it in a, in a little bit different way. If you get a close-up of the insect, you can see that, yeah, it's like an aphid, but it's, it's, it's very small, like he said. And they secrete this wax that produces these woolly masses at the base of needles. And because the eastern hemlocks are not resistant uh, to the adelgid and there are no natural enemies, as Rolf had mentioned, you get these really high densities of adelgids occurring on these trees. And when they go dormant in the summer and they and and they go to sleep, basically, they could you can see that they attach at the base of the needles and they just have a halo of the wax that surrounds them. And then when they wake up in the fall, they they start pumping out that wax. This map shows you all the hemlock uh, species that occur in the world. We have several species occurring in Asia two species that occur in Western North America and two in Eastern North America. The reason I show you this is hemlock woolly delgit is found on all these other hemlock species in Western North America and Asia, but was never found in the East, was never, never co-evolved with this tree, with these trees. And so when it was introduced in the 20th century, uh, it, it had a tree that had co-evolved and and hadn't developed any kinds of resistance to the insect, and there were no natural enemies that had evolved as well. So when you look at a hemlock tree and it's been growing, you get these new shoots that are that are growing, and you can see by the green, you know, midrib here that that these basically or these little branchlets that this is all new growth, and this is where the adelgids like to colonize at the base of those needles. 
And when they do colonize, you see what happens here is that you, not only does it kill that new growth, but it prevents any new shoots from growing, which conifers really requ require. And so as a result, the dieback is fairly quick, especially if the trees are um, impacted by other things like drought. I wanna show you a little bit about this life cycle. It's very interesting because it really relates very well to the natural enemies that Rolf introduced to you. So you can understand why it's important for us to, um, why we feel so well, why we feel so good about these natural enemies. We have two generations per year of hemlock woolly adelgid. We have some funny names for them. And so essentially what we see is the insect hatches in the summer, and when they get onto the base of those needles, you see that there's no development all the way until October. And then all of a sudden with the first cool snap, they wake up. And you can see that through the winter, they continue to develop until they become an adult by February. So right now we have adults on the trees in that systems generation. And these adults lay eggs in March. And then a new generation that looks similar to the first one now develops very quickly in the spring, and then they'll lay eggs again in July. So two generations per year for hemlock woolly adelgid. So I'm gonna pivot a little bit and tell you uh, and introduce these predators to you, uh, Laracobius nigrinus and Laracobius osakensis. Rolf's already done that. Uh, these are specific predators of hemlock woolly adelgid and uh, they don't feed and develop on any other species that we have in North America. So they were deemed safe for introduction. The one uh, Negrinus that is shown over here is actually from the Adelgids and Western Hemlocks uh, that occur in British Columbia, Washington, Oregon. And so that was the first one introduced. And then Laracobius osakensis comes from Japan, which is where the hemlock woolly adelgid we have in the east comes from. So now I'm gonna go back to this life cycle so you can see that the beetles are present in the winter. Now, when you go outside in the winter, you don't see very many insects flying around, do you? Generally speaking, insects are in a dormant state in the winter, but hemlock woolly adelgid, I mean, but Laracobius nigrinus is active in the winter. And they're actually feeding on the adelgids when they find them. Uh, and then when the females are ready to lay eggs, they do so right about the time that the adelgid females are laying eggs. So a female beetle will lay one egg in that woolly ovisac, and that eggs will, the egg will hatch, and the larvae that you see here start feeding on those eggs. And eventually those larvae will continue to feed and basically rip up and what we what we use the, the term we use is shred the ovisacs on a branch and i just want to show you this picture here i went out last week to goshen which isn't that far from the shenandoah maybe a couple hour drive and we turned over a, a branch that had adelgids on it and i want to show you here you can see a larva and here you can see another larva, a little bit less focused. And this was a site where we released Laracobius osakensis about nine years ago. And so the trees in that site were doing fairly well, and the understory trees were very healthy. And yet there was still a high population of adelgids, uh, and the adelgids were doing fine, but the predators appeared to be flourishing at that site. So now let's go back to the Laracobius nigrinus life cycle. At about this time, the larvae are beginning to drop. And what they do is when they drop from the tree and they go into the soil and they'll pupate, and then they will turn into an adult and they stay in the soil. So they are dormant in the soil and they're dormant during the same time that the adelgids are dormant. So that's why I wanted to show you the two life cycles, because when HWA wakes up in the fall, that's when the beetles come out of the soil. So they're very synchronous with the cystens generation of HWA. So there are some important things that we've been able to do at Virginia Tech. 
we we found the Beatles, we studied them, we got permission to release them, we began releasing them throughout the Eastern U.S. Laracobius nigrinus in 2003, Laracobius osakensis in 2012. We released over a half a million beetles. We have a lab where we rear the beetles. We 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 develop the rearing procedures for this insect, and uh, we've been we've been basically distributing them throughout the eastern U.S. So then in 2010, we learned that this insect is establishing really well. And in fact, not only is it establishing, but it's spreading from its initial locations. So the next step in this project was to actually determine if they were impacting the adelgid populations. It's great if they're establishing, but it doesn't matter if they're not impacting the population. So we had a large scale project. It took four years to carry out. We partnered with the Forest Service, University of Tennessee, University of Massachusetts, Amherst, and then, of course, ourselves, and I had two master's students involved in this project. And you can see that we, it was pretty wide range geographically, all the way from New Jersey down to Georgia. And these are all sites where the adelgid, where the predators have been determined to be established. When we look at that cystins generation, there are a couple of things that happen during that winter. We do get winter mortality when temperatures really get cold for short periods of, periods of time. That can impact hemlock woolly adelgid survivorship. And then we had the predators as well, and we were looking at predation. And then we wanted to see what both led to in terms of resulting populations of hemlock woolly adelgid cystins. So how do we do this? Well, we go to these sites and we know that predators are present during the winter. So we identify branches with similar densities and we will monitor what happens to those branches over time through the winter and the spring. And then we cage some branches to prevent the predators from attacking the adelgids on those branches. And by caging them, we can see what happens without a predator present and then compare that to branches where the predators are present. We're not, inter we're not doing anything or manipulating anything other than keeping the predators off those branches. So then we can contrast the adelgid populations on the caged branches and the uncaged branches. So obviously this is a lot of a lot of bar graphs, but these are nine sites. These are the nine sites I showed you on the figure, and this shows you the level of winter mortality close to 90 or greater percent at times in New Jersey, the most northern site that we tested. And you can see in Maryland and Virginia, we had high levels of mortality in the same years. As we move further south to Tennessee, in Georgia, we see that winter mortality was much lower. So winter mortality is, is pretty important and it varies from year to year. And you see uh, the fact that the further north you go, the more impactful it is. Now on top of that, we look at oversack disturbance from the predator. And you can see that over a four year period, we were building back populations in 2015 because they have, there was an event called the polar vortex, which basically killed over 95% of all the adelgids in the eastern U.S., but they rebound back really quickly. Well, they rebound, and then the predators themselves have to rebound. So they, they basically follow the population of their prey. And so you can see here that in this dark green bar, there's a significant predator effect, although only 20% of oversacks are disturbed. By 2016, we're up to over 40 percent and by 2017 over 50 percent and then a little bit less in 2018 and this this line graph here shows you the number of beetles that we captured during those years and we're pooling all the sites all nine sites together so it shows you there's a really good correlation between the number of insects we're capturing and the impacts on those adult on those uh oversacks so really getting some significant effect but what we also also note is that there is a period in time in the life cycle of the adelgid where this predator is not active, it's in the soil. And so there is believed to be a need to find additional predators to help impact that second generation. And to that end, uh, there are flies, tiny silver flies that have been found 
in Western North America associated with hemlock woolly adelgid, just like Laracobius is. And they have been they have been studied and recently introduced into the eastern US. And releases began in 2015. Uh, they do lay eggs in those similar cages that I showed you earlier. And they can impact populations in those cages. We are still trying to work on getting them established. So it's pretty early in the game. I also want to follow up a little bit with what Rolf mentioned about chemical control. So chemical control is you know, really important for individual tree protection uh, to provide that short-term relief until natural enemies can really uh, have an impact. And so generally speaking, the best way to apply this materials in the soil or into the tree and the trees take up the poison and the insects that suck on that will die and is very minimal environmental impact because it's right around the tree and it's taking it up and you're not doing a foliar spray um, and, and getting a lot of pesticide flowing around. So because the, the chemical control has some positive attributes and the biocontrol has some positive attributes, we developed a protocol for actually integrating chemical and biological control. So using chemicals judiciously, strategically, and then also introducing natural enemies into sites. And these sites are available from the US Forest. This, this particular publication is available from the US Forest Service. And the idea is you find a few trees that you wanna treat, you wanna protect. Uh, the mother tree at a site, recreation site. And then you find other trees that you're going to release beetles in and let those beetle populations build up. And then after five years or seven years, when the protection leaves that tree that you've treated, you have a built up beetle population to handle any population buildup on those previously treated trees. So that is the approach that we've been recommending um, throughout much of the East. I did want to mention, just finish up with the current work that we're doing at Virginia Tech. One of the things we're doing is Matt, a master's student, Ashley Hillen, mine, uh, is looking at the effect of these soil application uh, insecticides on the Laracobius beetles in the soil. So they're in the soil during the summer. Do these, do, do these soil applied insecticides affect their survivorship? Carrie Preston is a PhD student, and she is looking at the impact of the beetles and attempting to look at the impact of the flies, not only on HWA, which is something we did in the study I talked about, but we also want to see if that translates into improved tree health. And then a brand new master's student, Olivia Andrews, is looking at the silver fly release, different silver fly release strategies to try to ensure or optimize um, their ability to establish at sites. So I want to thank the Shenandoah National Park Trust for really becoming part of Team Larry. And these are all former students, past and current colleagues uh, that have been working on the, on the research, on the releases uh, and monitoring of the predators for hemlock woolly delgid. And maybe everybody will recognize Dale here in this image, him doing a release in the Shenandoah National Park. And so with that, um, I'd like to thank everybody from the Forest Entomology Lab at Virginia Tech. And what I'm gonna do is see if I escape, that worked. I'm gonna stop my share. Share is stopped, so someone already did that. And we're gonna watch a really good video that uh, has been put together that really describes what's going on in this program and with hemlocks at the Shenandoah National Park. hundreds in the early 1900s it's good to remember that the eastern hemlock tree was one of the largest trees in a mountain environment they could be between 
four to six feet in diameter and be essentially the size of a pond, almost to the size of a ponderosa pine out west, which is really astounding. And they created their own microclimates where the, the areas right around streams would be extraordinarily cool, even in the heat of the summer. It was really the, the, the key to influencing Herbert and Lou Hoover's decision to buy Rapidan Camp on the east side of the mountains. And it was also a key deciding factor for Addie Pollock when she heard that the, the trees in Limberlost were going to be cut down. It inspired her to spend $10 a tree to save the last 100 trees in the area and preserve that grove of hemlocks in perpetuity. In 1988, park staff found hemlock woolly adelgid in Shenandoah National Park. It was a small, aphid, invasive insect that caused a hemlock decline by sap feeding on the hemlocks. The hemlock woolly adelgid feeds on the needles at the base of the needle and sucks the sap and the starches out of the tree. It causes needle loss and general decline over a period of about three to four years and ultimately mortality. By the mid-90s, many of the park hemlock sites were infested with HWA, hemlock woolly adelgid, and by the early 2000s, we saw upwards of 90 to 95% mortality in the park. And here's an example of a tree that's been affected by hemlock woolly adelgid, and has probably been dead for at least 10 years. So as a result of a lot of the decline of the hemlocks in the mid-90s and early 2000s, the park began a hemlock woolly adelgid suppression program. At first, we focused on larger hemlocks in developed areas, and staff used a combination of horticultural oils and horticultural soaps, and we did foliar treatments. That method was fairly time-consuming, took a lot of retreatments, but by 2005, uh, we found a better method. It was a, a midocloprid soil treatment, or soil injection method and we be began that in earnest in 2005. And we treated trees on an eight-year treatment cycle. And as of 2021, we've treated upwards of 28,000 trees to date in the park. So the soil injection treatment method uh, involved putting sort of metered doses around the root collar of a specific hemlock tree. The imidacloprid was very specific to that tree. There were no non-target effects for other vegetation. Um, it's, it's a very effective treatment method. It gives you about eight years of treatment longevity, but it's not something you necessarily want to continue in perpetuity. One limitation of the systemic pesticide that we were using, it didn't allow us to treat trees that were close to water. One thing that we realized was, how are we going to get those trees treated? We actually reached out to Virginia Tech in 2015 and began a project where we began releasing predatory beetles or biocontrols in certain areas that were untreated in order to sort of become less reliant on chemical controls. So as part of the hemlock woolly adelgid biocontrol program, we're using beetles called Laracobius beetles. They're in the Laracobius genus. They feed exclusively on hemlock woolly adelgid. They need hemlock woolly adelgid to complete their life cycle. So as part of this program, we not only work closely with the Virginia Tech Entomology Lab and Dr. Scott Salem, very closely with sort of the release piece, but we also do monitoring to make sure that we have the Laracobius beetles established at the sites that we put them at. And we've seen so far at some of the release sites that we've done Laracobius releases in 2017 and 2019, um, we're seeing desirable and good reestablishment of Laracobius beetles at those sites. And we're seeing some natural movement of Laracobius as much as two to three miles. So we're finding Laracobius in hemlock clusters that weren't, as, weren't part of a release site. So ultimately, we'd like to become less reliant on chemical controls. And we see perhaps in 10 to 20 years that that could be possible. We're already starting to see good establishment of Laracobius beetles in some of the areas where we did releases in 2017 and 2019, so it's very promising. This hemlock woolly adelgid biocontrol work 
wouldn't be possible without the generous donations of the Shenandoah National Park Trust. The trust donates a significant amount of money towards the chemical treatments that help save our hemlocks, but also purchases the beetles um, through Virginia Tech. great things about working with the Shenandoah National Park Trust is that we can explore um, treatments that don't involve pesticides. We can actually um, release all these Laracobia beetles to try and control the hemlock woolly adelgid. And that's very important because what we need is we need a bridge to the future. We need a capability to bring the hemlock trees that have come with us to a, to a time period where the adelgid is under control and the groves of hemlocks have an amount of time necessary to recover. So we do have hope because the Laracobia beetle uh, treatments appear to be working, but we need time to have those treatments be successful. Hi, I'm Jessica Cochalone, and I am the Executive Director of the Shenandoah National Park Trust, and we are proud to be the philanthropic partner of the Shenandoah National Park. Our mission is to invest philanthropic dollars in initiatives and programs that ensure Shenandoah remains the crown jewel of the national park system, an economic driver for the region, and a national treasure for all to enjoy today and tomorrow. If you are interested in learning more about Shenandoah National Park Trust and supporting this program, please visit us online at snptrust.org. We have a robust field staff um, that do a lot of natural resource work throughout the park. So we have backcountry rangers, we have botanists, we have uh, uh, biological technicians, and they're out in the park doing a variety of different field activities. So we use those folks and they report back to us whenever they find clusters of healthy hemlocks or even hemlocks that are maybe 40% uh, live crown or better. So we use our field staff, we use our visitors, uh, we use our cooperators, and uh, and 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 it's largely uh, largely uh, due to Dale Meyerhofer, our our lead forest health technician, and he's on this uh, he's on this call and can answer questions uh, uh, if if he's if he'd like to. So we're treating roughly 2,500 to 3,500 hemlocks per year with imidacloprid soil treatments, um, and that has resulted in preserving and protecting upwards of 29,000 hemlocks since 2005. Um, and as far as the HWA suppression as a result of beetle releases, that's been done at six different sites, um, primarily South District sites, but one Central District site. And that's sort of in the early stages. Um, that biocontrol piece is in the early stages. Uh, and that's sort of to be determined in terms of how much control we're going to get at those sites. Then maybe Scott or Dale wants to jump in on that too. So uh, usually the sites that are chosen, there's a protocol for the kinds of sites you would generally release beetles at because they are hard to produce. Um, and also, you know, going out and collecting, there's a lot of time and effort involved in that. So usually we, we require trees to be healthy and we, we require trees to have a fairly reasonable population of hemlock woolly adelgids so that the beetles can um, build up, uh, survive, and then be able to build up, reproduce, and sustain over time. So that's, a, that's an important combination. Uh, when we look at these sites. And I think when I first went to one of your sites, you know, one of the first release sites, uh, I saw a lot, it was a lot of understory trees that had good foliage and had decent populations. And, and it was like, this is not old growth trees. This is a certain type of tree that 
we think is is how the predators and the hemlocks are going to the predators are going to be successful and how the hemlocks are going to come back is are, are these younger trees that are healthy and allow the predator populations to build up and uh, be sustainable. We studied the adelgid in Western North America, sampled for potential natural enemies. We, kind, we know what kinds of insects generally feed on adelgids. And working with our Canadian partners in British Columbia, we, we found a location where Laracobius nigrinus was prevalent and consistently prevalent and active. And the same thing in Japan, we went to adelgid sites near Osaka and eventually moved into the ski mountains where adelgids and hemlocks occur. And again, we found this was a new species to science, was finding Laracobius osakensis. And so again, prevalent, active during the same time of year that I mentioned in the life cycle. And then, you know, it shows that uh, we did some tests in the field to show that they were impacting populations in the field at the native sites. So then we felt that they were potential biocontrol agents that we would like to import and study for potential release in the United States. We're unaware of any particular predators. Uh, I mean, they're, they're not like really easy to look for and find. Um, they're active in the winter before most insects are active. So they avoid that kind of interaction. Um, and then the larvae are present on the eggs in the in right now. And, you know, insects are just waking up right now, just like trees are waking up and plants are waking up. So these insects kind of avoid that kind of problem because they're active when it's too cold for most insects. Uh, it's very labor intensive. This is one insect that has this is an insect that has one generation per year. They have a fairly delicate life cycle. We have to feed them adelgids from the time that they emerge. Uh, basically what we do is we just keep a few hundred of them and then we will feed them and then by the time spring comes around we get them to lay eggs and then we have a, a couple of large cold rooms 15 degrees centigrade that we that we basically put uh, infects infested foliage in that have beetle eggs and larvae feeding on and we actually let the larvae feed and eventually drop into jars. And then we put them in soil and we try to simulate the conditions they would have in the soil in the field. And we have to keep them at certain conditions for the summer. And then we have to wake them up in the fall when the adelgids wake up. So it's a very complicated dance from you know the beginning to end. And it took a lot of creative effort by former students and technicians to figure out the life cycle in a way that they could develop this rearing procedure. But now we're moving to the point where we are able to collect them in the field and capture them and then move them to new sites because they're so well established and they become so numerous at some sites that that's really pretty much the plan for the future. All right, well, in the interest of keeping people on time, as we said, this would end at seven, we're again, I'm gonna go ahead and call it a night. Uh, Dr. Slom, Rolf, and Superintendent Pat Kenny, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And to all of our guests, uh, thank you so much for joining us. If you are interested in learning more about this work or supporting our work with the park, you can visit us at www.snptrust.org. I'm going to put it in the chat box. Um, thank you so much. Um, some new names, and I can't have seen your guys' faces, but definitely some new names that I haven't seen before. So I hope to, to meet you in, all in person soon. Have a wonderful night. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Good night.